Welcome. This is going to be a slightly gentler session. Um, as I mentioned, but a couple of you just jumped on, it may behoove you to have a chair for part of the sequence. And what we're going to do is start in a simple cross-legged pose down on the floor. So we're not going to use the chair to start. <clears throat> if it's comfortable for you, and you might just see if you can make it comfortable, let's rest the hands on the knees. You might even employ this subtle little mudra where the thumb and index fingers just gently touch. And find a midway point between, you know, leaning back and leaning forward. Once you feel like you've established a comfortable seat, let's, uh, let's bring our awareness to breathing sensation. Now these signals might come, they might be auditory if your breath happens to be making some noise. You might happen to zero in on breath sensations right where they enter and exit your body, which is going to be the nose. Then again, your breath sensations might be <clears throat> strongest in the chest. You might feel the chest lift or expand and can release or slightly drop. Then again, your breath sensations might be strongest down in your belly. You're really tapping into that diaphragmatic breathing, which on some level all breathing is, but kind of the deeper, lower version of it. You'll feel the waves of prana is simply the word the yogis use to designate the sensation associated with breathing. You might feel those waves down low. So what we're going to do is use the breath sensations that are most 
sort of available for you to experience where the sensory data is strongest. And use that as the hub of your awareness, sort of the center of focus. No. Even if breathing is the center of your focus and you're able to primarily fix your concentration on those breathing sensations, awareness, of course, is even bigger. You're aware of the room you're in. You're aware that you're interacting with, you know, me and others on a screen. You're aware of sounds in the background. You're aware that you're sitting. Full-fledged images might rise to your mind that have nothing to do with breathing. Projections about tomorrow or anywhere into the future. Memories from the past. And these are all things that can sort of rise up in awareness despite concentration and focus being on breathing. And so the practice of one specific form of meditation, a very widely practiced form, mindfulness, asks that we notice all those other things that bubble up non judgmentally. on purpose, in the present moment. So to be clear, when we embark on this particular form of meditation, it's not a sign of failure when your mind wanders away from breathing. In fact, that'll inevitably happen. What we're doing is sort of taking five or 10 or 20 minutes out to just notice the nature of our mind. And we use the breath as a hub so that whatever whatever does bubble up outside of breathing sensations You know, we don't get too lost in it. That's a daydream practice. That can be cool too. This is different. So this practice asks that we get insight. We notice. We observe. Almost as though at a slight distance. Like we're a witness. We're befriending a part of our own psyche. So for the last minute, just to reiterate, there is a little feeling tone that comes with most mindfulness. You know, it helps to be curious. We want to be open. We want to be accepting of what bubbles up. And it's even done with a sense of self-love. So to finish up our meditation, from a curious, open, accepting, and loving position, center your awareness center the really more concentration on breathing sensations
and be available to witness with non-attachment anything else that bubbles up and in the intervening moments return to breath awareness last minute Okay, everybody. Let's gently switch the cross of the legs. And fold forward. <clears throat> now, as you're here, you'll really release through the crown of your head, through the back of the neck. have enough support through the arms where it feels like you really can let go you know, through your back hmm. Last couple breaths here. You can even let the head move a little side to side or do little yes gestures. Oh, goodness, that feels nice. And then slowly uncurl your way up back to a neutral seat. And let's do a side bend each way. So one hand down on the ground, out from your hip, one arm up along your ear, and just find a little side bend. Now you can look in the direction of the lifted arm, you could look straight ahead toward the middle of the room, out toward the screen, or you can even let your head do a little counter turn. Come up and switch. So one hand is out from the hip, and it's actually helping to press the hip down. You can really see that move right there. So if I'm just leaning, uh, this hip's going to lift a little. So part of what this down arm is doing is lowering the hip so that the stretch comes you know, in both directions. It's got a bottom and it's got a top. <coughs> You got options with the head, with arm, straight ahead, or down. Oh my 
Yeah, that feels good. One more breath here. Let's release that. Next, let's extend the legs out, straight out in front. This is called Dandasana. It means like a staff, rod, stick, staff pose. And then from here, let's just do a little easy twist. Same option with the head. Head can be with chest. Head can kind of stay up the center. Head could even go the opposite direction. Let's come back. Switch. Just a nice easy twist. Maybe even explore all three possibilities with head with, neutral, counter. All right, and then let's come back. Last one, let's go back to a cross leg. Find a little twist, so I'm taking right hand to left knee, raising left arm. And then finding a little side bend. So this one now has components of twisting, which is kind of a minor element, secondary element, and side bending, which is a little more pronounced. Oh my god, that feels good. Release. Last one to the opposite side. So now I've got left hand on right knee. Right arm rises up along the ear. Side bend. <clears throat> you know, like two thirds side bend, you know, one third little tiny twist. Goodness, that is lovely. Last full breath here. Wow. And let's release that. Next, everybody, we're going to transition to quadruped. All right. So please and always, because I don't always uh, say this, but any anything you can do to help alleviate discomfort with knees on the ground it's not an issue for many maybe even for most uh, but the simple act of doubling up your mat getting a thicker cushier mat or in this instance laying out you know a eight fold blanket okay so the basics of the quadruped are probably pretty obvious, right? Your hands, or at least the cut of the wrists, are pretty much right under your shoulders. Your knees are pretty much right under your hips. And your spinal column is basically, you know, on a nice clean line. Now, let's try moving the head first. M without moving anything else, or try to limit movement elsewhere, let the face, the skull, the head, drop down a little. Like you were letting your nose get two inches closer to the mat. Then let your head, your skull, that's when maybe the nose is the center, get two inches away from your mat, up toward the ceiling. I'm not changing my gaze, that's key. Downward, upward. And the upward's where you really want to focus your attention. But we do the downward just so we've got some contrast. Down, up. 
protract, retract. This is your head forward looking at a screen. And here's your head pulling back and getting nice extension and developing strength and creating that unrounded neck that we want. Last couple. Ah, oh, it's powerful. Last one. Oh, that is good business right there. Okay, everybody. So please come to uh, sitting on your tuck toes. Might be a little hard to see. It really is getting so dark. Um, all right, just briefly on the tuck toes. Those of you that are kind of new to this or for whom it consistently just never gets easier, uh, maybe you need to practice it more. Um, but if you need to bail out from it, you could just be up on your knees with your toes in a tucked position, which allows you to still like really stretch out the soles of the feet in a nice way, but with a little less weight coming down on to the feet. Awesome. So next we're going to come back to the quadruped shape and we're going to push it forward and backward. So your spine stays pretty much level to the ground like my hand is and I'm just pushing forward and backward. Okay? Push. Pull. Push. Pull. It's like six or eight of these guys. You're just gliding. And described as a negation, which I don't usually like to describe poses in that way, but just to help fill it out a little bit, it's not cat and dog tilt, or cat and um, cow. In fact, that's basically the shape you're trying to avoid for this one. You're just finding that neutral. Last two. Oh, gosh, last one. Mm. Okay, one more time. Let's go back and sit on the tuck toes. Remember, if you need to, you can kneel, if that feels better. It'll probably feel easier, but uh, you might like the full tuck, or you might prefer the kneel. So, either one. Let's reach arms forward. And just turn the hands out at your thumbs, back at your wrists back through the fingers, although back through the fingers probably will still just be down. Oh. Oh. Okay. And then let's shake it out. One more all fours. Let's do some cat and dog tilts this time. So the cat is a pleasant, gentle, especially for this particular session, kind of a gentle amount of global rounding. I mean, there's a little bit of rounding happening everywhere in your spine. There is an apex, right? This part's higher probably than this part, uh, but I'm really trying to get a little bit of flexion everywhere. And then in the opposite direction of movement, but the same kind of like idea just get a little bit of global extension. I'm not hammering away at only one spot. I'm trying to gently move into this arched position like a cow with a little bit born in every part of the spine. Let's try that six times only. So round, cat shape. Not too intense. Spread it out. Arch into the cow shape. Not too intense. And really spread it out. Three more. And then we're coming up. Okay. 
two more. And officially, as you may have already noticed, I've been decoupling these from breathing, so we're really just focusing on the movement. Each one of these is highly probably lasting much longer than just a half a breath segment. All right. Next, everybody, we'll come back to the tuck toes. Or sorry, let, let me rephrase. Let's come back to the tuck toes with the kneel and just bring one foot forward. And then come up. All right. We are up. So what we're going to do is start in a comfortable, easy like stance with the feet about six inches apart, hands on the hips. And we're just going to step the left foot backward. Just a modest little step there. And then we're going to take the hands onto the hips if they left the hips and just kind of see that those hips square up. Now to be clear, I've got a pretty decent sized bend in this front leg. I've got virtually no bend in the back leg, but that back heel is off the ground, right? I'm just on my tuck toes, kind of a, kind of coming back to the tuck toe position that we warmed up with because you need it here in your lunge. Yeah, simple enough. Then we're going to take that back foot and just bring it forward. Shabam. Switch sides. New foot goes back. It's in the tuck toe position. Hips square up. And I'm focusing on that because once one leg goes backward, the tendency is that hip kind of goes open a little bit. I mean, which is fine, but we're going to just like practice a little bit more on the square and upside. Let's step forward, back to side one. Now the other little nuance, we went over this uh, last session, but not everyone's here for every session. That front leg, not only is it bent, but it has a little external rotation, i.e. you would want the knee kind of pushing a little more toward the little toe rather than falling inside of the big toe. You really just want it neutral, but often that means we've got to push out a little. Now the back hip, because that hip tends to want to open up a little bit, we want to really focus on turning that back hip, almost like we're turning it in. So the back hip has a slight inward bias, front hip has a slight outward bias, ultimately that keeps us kind of centered. Let's release, other side, so you got the toe tuck back there. You got the squared up hip. You got the slight external turn. Switch again. Awesome. And then switch again. Oh, man. Last one. Great. And then come back. Next, let's bring feet about hip width distance apart. Bring the hands behind your back. Gently reach up both arms. Fully reach up both arms. Reach both arms back a little bit and allow for a slight back bend, a global back bend, kind of like we did with the dog tilt. Make it nice and well distributed, not too intense, but open it up a little bit. Bring it back, let the arms come down, let the hands come behind your back. Four more. Arms go up, kind of to their edge. Then they start to go back, and you do a slight back bend. And release. Arms behind your back. Two more. Up. Back. And 
Release. Oh. Last one. Up. Back. And release. Next, back to the lunge. Step your right foot back. Square up the hips. Reach your right arm up. And at the very top, reach your right arm slightly back and up. Ooh, that is juicy. And release and step it forward. New side. Step. Get all the components of our lunge, which we worked on independently. And then basically it's one arm, like we were doing the double arm stuff earlier. Up, and then at the very top, a little bit of back. It should really hit the psoas muscle on your back straight leg, the front part of one one particular hip flexor muscle. And release. Two more per side. Step. Lift. Reach back a little. Release. Step. Switch sides. Whatever that back leg is, that's the arm that lifts. Reach back a little at the top. Oh. Last one. Everybody. Next. Here's when ideally you've got access to a chair or maybe even just something you can lean on. But I'm hoping we've got the chair for what comes after this. Okay. So I showed this the other day, but I know not everybody was there. I showed this the other day without a chair, um, but I want to do it with a chair. So here's how it looks. Sorry, it's getting a little dark. Phase one is you square up your back hip, just like we were doing for lunge. The hips are square. Phase two, you rotate and you open your hip, so you're kind of facing that plane. Phase three, you do inward rotation, and you turn in, so now your up leg has a little inward angle. Okay? Another way to think about it when we do it, and I'll cue it this way at least once, is basically think about your belly button shining down or to one side or to the other side. But it's less about twisting your back and it's more about rotating from your hip. So let's try. I'm going to go to my second side just to make sure I'm switching every time. But this is probably your first go at it. So with or without the forearms, right, you could just hold the chair. Try to square your hip. That means if there was something like level on your back, it would just balance there. Right? That's the square hip. Now as soon as I go for open hip, that bowl is going to slide. So I'm going to move it. Open hip looks like this. Now if I had a dowel, like a you know big stick across my back, it could still be there because I haven't really twisted my spine, even though my belly button now faces a different direction. I've rotated at the hip. Phase three, you won't get nearly as much movement, but a little bit of inward. Okay, then come back to square and let's switch legs. 
So you're square and neutral. Belly button shines to the floor. Then you're open, belly button shines to one side. Then you're square and neutral, and belly button at least gets a little rotation the opposite direction. You know, if you know your classic poses pretty well, this is Ardha Chandrasana. Back to square, that's Virabhadrasana 3, the open ones, Ardha Chandrasana, half moon. Let's release. One more time through both legs. Square. No hurry. Open. And inward. Back to neutral. And last time, second side. Vita Bhadrasana 3. Belly faces the ground. Ardha Chandrasana, belly faces the rising leg. Revolved Ardha Chandrasana, belly faces the down leg. Come back to square it up, and then release. All right, y'all. We'll, we'll be doing that one again, not this session, but uh, another session, and just the super quick review, right, that whole thing, and some of you have done, gone through the drill. You know, without a chair, the same idea, right, you're square, open, and then, whew, and then return. You know, it's just... It's a lot easier to find it with the chair and not worry so much about the balancing. Um, and the whole idea with this particular sequence is we were dialing down intensity a little bit. But that's still highly therapeutic for your back. In fact, those four, I mean, we did a lot of stuff, but the cat, cow, the stand up and reach, the lunge and reach, and then that last three-way hip dynamic, those are all highly researched movement patterns um, that emanate largely, at least the combination, um, from a guy named Dr. Stuart McGill, who I reference a lot. He's an exercise physiologist at a big university up in Canada and has been studying biomechanics and movement for you know, 30 years. So uh, shout out to that dude. Anyway, next, y'all. We're going to use our chair in a very different way. If you do have access to a portable chair like this, that would really be opportune. If you, uh, if the only way you can do it is maybe like go and set your feet on a couch or something, your calves, that's possible too. But if you can just like bring over a dining room chair or an office chair or something like that, that would be ideal. So here's what we're going to do. Give everybody a chance to set it up. You're going to have one leg run straight down along the floor. This feels amazing. Um, I don't want that one leg running into the chair. And then you're going to have one calf. So one like clean 90 degree bend leg. One totally straight leg. And you're just going to hang out like that for a minute. Oh my gosh, that feels good. Jeez, a little ways. Oh. So awesome. Now, you can just completely relax with it, or if you want a little more stretch, and then it also kind of ties to our lunge, because this is a little bit like a lungy shape, but not exactly. It's really not. 
because this leg would normally be backward in a lunge. But if you want to kind of tie it to the lunge in a way, you could let the long leg find the matching arm, left and left for me, and just let that arm flex overhead. Let me just be clear though, there's also some advantage to just relaxing into the sky. And what are we looking for here? I mean, in a sense, I almost don't even want to lay it on you because you might find your own really, your own sweet kind of sensations that emanate from just getting into this shape. But for most folks, this whole line on the straight leg really opens up. If you've been sitting at a chair for any part of the day, this area folds, and now that area opens. Plus, we'd actively open this area many times prior to the shape in our session, so now it can just kind of open softly, passively. The bent leg helps to relax the hips and the pelvis into the ground. So it just should feel really soothing on your low back. And yet you can find this kind of passive opening here. Oh my God, it feels so good to me, this shape. Now we're just going to be here for a few more breaths because we're going to switch sides. Now another option is you can very subtly, with the long straight leg, steer it slightly in. I've made a couple references to that action tonight, a subtle inward rotation. And for future reference, uh, this is a pose you could be in for 5, 10, 12 minutes at a go per leg. So two minutes rest tonight. So we're going to switch legs. So new leg up the chair. New leg on the ground. Possibly a brief little like experiment, kind of connecting to what we did in the lunge with active arm. If that feels too good to give up on, stay in it, but I'll suggest that for the bulk of the pose, like basically the last minute and a half, it's just, it's really relaxed. No, dude, no, 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 no. I can hardly get enough of this shape, y'all. Last breath or two here. You know you've all got the green light to do this at a later date for a much longer period of time. But at least a two minute simmer for this session. So next, oh my goodness. And this will basically cap it off, everybody. 
we are going to um, take both legs up the chair. Both legs. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm on top of the time. Oh. Uh, just one quick... Um, Modification, if you'd prefer to take two legs straight up a wall, I'll go ahead and do that. That certainly won't break the flow. Um, otherwise, go ahead and let both legs rest up the chair. Calves right on the seat. For me, I always arrange the back so it's not going to interfere with my feet in any way, shape, or form. Whew, just let those hips settle and we're going to clock about five five minutes on the clock but you know that experience can can be very very different um, depending on kind of where you go in your shavasana so please everybody let the arms open to a comfortable shape center your head
So, if you haven't already, please make your way back to a comfortable seat where, where we started. <clears throat> And let's just br very briefly come back to a nice, comfortable seated position. Perhaps your hands in a an easy mudra on your knees. And just to conclude, reconnect to breathing sensations. And then just in closing, it's a very different type of Sangha than we're, when we were gathered physically together. We're just maybe appear as, you know, small icons on the side of the screen to each other. But many of you know each other. And we all know on some level, we are practicing as a group right now. There's a little collection of us all coming together um, as a Sangha. And if there wasn't that sense of support, it would be hard for, you know, the classes to sustain themselves. So in a way, even though, of course, our, our own practice is very private, maybe in our house by ourselves, um, we experience the poses in our own body, not in someone else's body. Uh, but the group connection is relevant. And I thank you all for coming and connecting over the interwebs. Namaste.